Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the fertile fields of Geldorf, where Lord Frigoberto and his army are marching through toward the dungeon up there to the north. It's actually kind of funny because Frigoberto has not spent much time in the Ward of Aurelia since it was founded. He's actually been traveling around, he's been underground, he's been all over the place. So this is kind of a homecoming for him, even though he skipped the city. He did go into the city, actually, when he um, was banished to the Void and then had to come back. But that's... he was only there for a short time, and that's the last time he's been there. Regardless, I am Marcus Aurelius, and this is Age of Wonders 3, a roleplay campaign where you, the viewer, gets to make the decisions. And I apologize that there haven't been much in the way of viewer decisions recently. I know the last episode should have been a council episode, but really wasn't. And now, I think I might be getting a little sick, so I want to record a bunch of episodes as quickly as I can, so I can have them to upload over the next couple weeks, which means, again, no council decisions. But by all means, make your voice heard in the comments, if there's something you'd like to see, or something that you would like our Empire to embark upon, simply state it, and I will, of course, read and respond to any comments that I see. It was asked that I do a catch-up episode to kind of catch up viewers as to what's gone on in the Empire of Aurelia since the beginning. And so that's what this episode is going to be. I'm going to be doing that, and I'm also going to be discussing the different wards based on the ward descriptions written by our wardens. With one exception, of course, that exception being Arctica, because uh, Kyonanon hasn't emailed me a ward description yet. So, Kion, if you see this... Get on that. <laughs> but regarding the history of the Empire of Aurelia, it all started... Well, we don't really know when it started exactly in the Old World. I like to keep it intentionally vague, but essentially the Aurelians were a wandering band of Germanic peoples about the time that things were going bad for the Roman Empire and the Huns were showing up. Roughly around that time period, they were moving away from their homes, they were traveling, and they discovered a portal into this new world. This new, and at the time, they had hoped, safe world. But that's as far as I really want to go into it in terms of detail, because, you know, we have some characters who claim Nordic ancestry, we have some characters who claim Roman ancestry. One of our chief gods is a, is a Norse god, so... We're just going to say it's a mixed group of people that came from different areas of North and East Europe during about the 3rd, 3rd or 4th century. Anyway, they took a portal and they ended up here in this new land. And they founded a city, the city of Aurelia. And at the time they had one... Well, they had two heroes right at the beginning. They had their lord, Frigoberto. And when I say lord, I think that bears a little bit of explanation. Frigoberto is an interesting character in that he is not necessarily a king. But he does wield kingly authority. The council is obviously very powerful. Essentially, Frigoberto... To give an example of Frigoberto, Frigoberto is like what Julius Caesar was. Where he wasn't officially the leader of the Roman Empire, but at the same time, nobody could really, aside from stabbing him multiple times on the Senate floor, nobody could really go against him politically. It's kind of like a situation where in a um, crisis, the citizens of Rome would nominate a man, and it was always a man in that time period, to take on executive control of the Empire. And there were really good examples of people who did this, like Cincinnatus, who uh, took over the Empire. When he was done, he retired and went back to his farm. And uh, there's some bad examples, like, for example, Augustus, who decided to just make it permanent. <laughs> and so it was. But, uh, so, Figueroa is not the sole power wielder of the Empire of Aurelia. The Council wields an awful lot of power, but just based on the necessities of the fact that I am one individual, and I am running this campaign, I kind of have to imbue Frigoberto with a little bit of executive power in order to, uh, to get anything done. But right now, he is not in charge of the army. It is Anya, the city feller, who is also a, our second hero. She started right at the beginning, and she's a dreadnought. 
And she's also traveled far across the world, seen many things, done many things, and now she is currently gathering a giant army of her own, an elite army known as Anya's Legion, that is heading north up to Druze to pick up a giant, and then it's going to be heading toward Carl, who was recently also declared war on by Rish Kayan. So we are not alone on this new world, as we discovered when we first moved here. There are many other groups of people. There are many races very different from the humans. There are the Tigran. There are the Draconians. There are the Halflings, the Elves, the Goblins, the Orcs, and uh, the Frostlings. Can't forget the Frostlings. And I think that's... Did I get them all? I think I might have got them all. And so there were five other leaders. Okay? One of them was a Draconian up here in uh, Zarnatu, Faldural, I think, or something like that. And she was a... What was she? A theocrat? And she's gone now. She was defeated. There is Camille Moonflower, the halfling rogue. There is Zoki of Clan Brago, the frostling rogue. There is Carl. Carl Hushwick or something along those lines. He is a halfling archdruid. There is Rish Kayan who is an Draconian Warlord. So as Frigoberto is also a Warlord, this nation here has similar units to what we have, only Draconian instead of human. And finally, underground, there is a Dwarf Theocrat known as Dwemus Strongmouth. So in the early history of Aurelia, we didn't encounter any of these people. So we were simply going around, expanding, taking out wandering parties of bandits, but it was discovered early on that some of these bandits were actually human. So it was determined that either there were humans native to this world, or that humans from the old world somehow managed to get over here in addition to the party from Aurelia, some of which had been here for quite a long time. No one really knows how humans first came to this world or if they were native to it, but the humans of Aurelia are so alike to the other humans that you really can't tell them apart. So it was interesting then that the first empire we met up with actually happened to be another human empire. And that was led over here by Leonis, who was a human dreadnought. And he had three cities at first, and then he eventually expanded into two more cities. But they were conquered and defeated by the Aurelians. And during that war, Leonis surrendered and ceded his empire over to form the combined newer, greater, stronger empire of Aurelia. And Leonis himself joined forces with the Aurelians and now is acting as one of our heroes. So the native, um, the native heroes of this world and the native humans of this world and the Aurelian humans who came from the old world have now kind of formed a nation together and there really is no distinction. Again, they're humans, they all kind of alike. It can be said that the people of Leonis's domain are a bit more civilized just because they were dreadnoughts. They were focused on steamworks and machinery, while the people of Aurelia are still kind of medieval in terms of their level of technological development. However, we do have airships, which is something to be happy about. So the first steps taken in this new world were to form the city of Geldorf, and then we moved and we took the city of Heraltishain. At that point, we also went underground and formed the city of Leticia. And then, after all of that, we started moving west during our war with Leonis and either founding new cities such as Stoicana or conquering his cities and continuing to press against him. Now, the peoples of Aurelia brought with them one god, their own god from the Old World, and that would be Wodenaz, the leader of the gods of the Old World, so to speak, the Norse pantheon. But also, once they arrived in this world, they were subjected to knowledge of a whole bunch of new gods, and many different religions and cults were formed. You've got the Lattice Maiden, who was a goddess of, uh, of insanity, who was actually one of the stronger gods in the Pantheon at the beginning, near the founding of Aurelia. Stronger than Woden as, certainly, at that time. And the Lattice Maiden has her own city dedicated to her down in the underground known as Leticia. She's also the patron goddess of berserkers. Then there is the goddess Stoica. Stoica is the goddess of wisdom and defense. She is known actually as the shield. 
And she is a goddess that is worshipped by Lord Frigoberto, as well as a lot of our other interesting characters, I guess you'd say. Um, Stoica currently is the second most notable goddess in the Aurelian pantheon in terms of number of worshippers after Wodenaz. When we conquered the Empire of Leonis, we adopted the two gods that they worshipped, the god of the sun and progress, known as Helios, and the goddess of the winter and tradition, known as Arctica. So while the Aurelian humans aren't as knowledgeable of these two gods as they are their own gods, there are many who have moved over, and also a lot of the humans that we have accepted into our empire that were originally not part of our empire obviously have kept the worship of their old gods. Helios, in particular, is pretty well represented among the Council of Aurelia. In addition to that, we have the Great Farmer, who is kind of a rural god who oversees the, uh, the farms of Aurelia. And uh, what else do we have here? We have Njord, who is the god of the sea and kind of merchanting in general. He's based here in Njordland. We have the Great Wanderer, who is a god that... We don't actually know a whole ton about, but apparently his shtick has something to do with wandering. And he also has a city down in the underground known as Wanderer's Way. Finally, there is the god Necros. Now, Necros was apparently a very powerful and well-known god in this world prior to the coming of the humans of Aurelia. And at first, the acceptance of a god focused on undeath was kind of frowned upon, and in reality, Necros didn't really have a full-scale religion in Aurelia, more so kind of like an underground cult. In fact, it's still referred to today as the cult of Necros, but uh, it's becoming more and more widespread. We do have necromancers in our empire, necromancer Hero, who's actually defending us here in Isima City, so the worship of that type of thing has become a little bit more accepted nowadays than it was in the past, and eventually... Necros is going to have his own city, we hope, somewhere up in this peninsula because it has access to a site that allows really cool kind of undeady bonus type things. So, with the war against Leonis won, the Empire of Aurelia took some time to kind of consolidate, and now we're at war with Carl, the halfling archdruid based up here in Hobton. And Carl is pretty far away from us, so getting to him is going to be tough because we have to go through potential lands owned by other people, like Zoki, who currently is our friend, and I think currently only has the city of Mistdale, his capital. But the good news is that we have an ally, or at least someone who is also attacking Carl, so his uh, attention is divided. And right now, Camille, who was looking askance at us at the beginning, seemed like a potential enemy, seems to be willing to kind of leave us alone, although we'll see how that continues as we develop more cities in her sphere of influence, since we're moving to the west here to try to get the heart of the Blight. And this is her city of, of Leicester. Or I guess, if you want to pronounce it the British way, like Leicester, maybe? So, we're doing some scouting, because also there's Dwemus to deal with. Dwemus has shown himself to be evil and hostile, and yet, we are doing okay, mainly because we fought together against Leonis. But I'm sure Dwemus is none too pleased that all of Leonis' lands fell under our dominion, and also that his exit from the underground into the above world has been blocked off a little bit by Isimus City. So those are all things that might lead to war with us and he in the near future. So that really is it. I mean, in terms of the history of the of the peoples of Aurelia and the Aurelian Empire, that pretty much sums it all up. So you could say that was kind of phase one of our arrival, right? We arrived in this world, we settled it, we colonized it, we learned how to understand magic, we learned how to fight the magical beings that existed here and to defend ourselves against them. We learned about new gods, and unlike the old world, the gods of Aurelia do exert influence and are noticeable. So it's funny because you can't be an atheist in this world because the gods are real. They manifest themselves. They give their followers powers. You cannot say that there are no gods. But even so, the vast majority of the Aurelian Council, based on the most recent census, not the vast majority total, but the largest group, let's say, the largest subgroup of Aurelians, are non-denominational. 
They don't worship any gods. So while they must acknowledge the existence of the gods, they simply don't care about them one way or the other. Which is uh, just fine. All right, so let's talk about the wards themselves. And again, these are not my words. These are the words of the elected wardens of those wards, who I will list. And we're going to start off with the land where we first got to this world, the Ward of Aurelia, which currently is this area here. It's bordered on the west by the Frostfang Mountains, and it's bordered on the east by this mountain range here that divides Aquarisia and Heraltasane from Aurelia. So it's this territory right here. And it includes the cities of Aurelia, which is the throne city of Frigoberto and the capital of our empire, and the city of Geldorf. And so this description was written by Warden Nicholas Roberts. And what he has to say is, The ward of Aurelia is the homeland and capital of our glorious empire. The valley is dominated by the two twin cities of Aurelia and Geldorf. Aurelia, the capital and the oldest city in our empire, is the heart of our imperial administration and politics, and it also is a city where the Grand Council of Aurelia meets. Aurelia is a city of traditional beliefs. Whether it be in gods, politics, trade, or family, Aurelia holds the traditional side of the spectrum close to heart. The same cannot be said for its twin city, Geldorf. Geldorf, in its infancy, and still is to this day, some say, a city of vice. The numerous gold mines and mana nodes attracted all kinds of prospectors. Brothels, saloons, casinos, and mana dens all pop up almost overnight, and Geldorf became a large boomtown. But it didn't stop there. While some of the gold and mana crystals were being funneled to fuel the massive red light district, the vast majority of it actually was used by Mayor Bryan to build libraries, schools, research centers, homes, for runaway slaves, and a market that is one of the most profitable in the empire. Though the two cities of Aurelia are different, they are still the same. Both are in their own tier when it comes to age and importance to the empire. For not only are they home to the city of swords masters and the largest warlord's keep of the empire, they also are the cities where all Aurelian humans can trace their lineage to. And it is this lineage that makes the ward of Aurelia proud, for it is the father of our empire. Thank you very much, Nick. That was very good. So that is the ward of Aurelia. Next, we're going to talk about the ward of the underground. And this is actually written by the warden of the underground, Wolfric Stonefang, who is an interesting counselor among the counselors of the Aurelian Empire because he is one of the very, very few non-humans. He is a Tigran, and he writes... The Ward of the Underground. The Ward of the Underground currently contains the cities of Leticia, which is home to the best mounted archers in the kingdom, and Wanderer's Way. High above the cities in the cavern's roof, the roof sparkles like a night sky, and there is a warm breeze that flows through the area coming from the great magma sea in the north. But just outside of our view, things move in the shadows. We are on a new frontier, fighting back against the untamed underground. It has been a long, hard process to set up these two cities, three now with Deepstone, fighting off all manner of beasts, but the people of Leticia and Wanderer's Way and Deepstone are hardier than most. Leticia's buildings have a design only a madman could think both beautiful and frighteningly strange. A mad woman, actually, since that would be, that would be the Lattice Maiden. It contains three main points of interest. Let's go take a look at it, actually. So when you visit the city of Leticia, what you see is a magma forge, lovingly nicknamed by the locals the Forge of Madness, because it is manned by the brilliantly mad craftsmen and women of the Lattice Maiden. It also contains a vault of vast knowledge to the southeast of the city, actually to the uh, southwest, it looks like. Some say this is the source of the madness in Leticia. And this is where the archers go to hone their skills and focus their minds. And last but not least, to the south, there is a beautiful spring surrounded by lush green vegetation and trees. And the water seems to give off a natural healthy glow. Horses that are given this water are stronger, faster, and healthier than any others. 
So because of the magical benefits to archery and to horses, that is why Leticia is known across the world, famous for its mounted archers. Now, Wanderer's Way, a newer city, is a place where all are welcome, and it does not matter. It's a very simple city with simple designs. And the trading post there attracts a lot of people looking to make some gold. Picks are working tirelessly at the Flow Rock Quarry, gathering the raw material and refining it into usable blocks, which are then sent to the locations they are needed all across the kingdom. And finally, to the northwest of the city grows a tree made of blue sparkling crystal, its glow emanating throughout the city. And that is kind of the back of the envelope description of the Ward of the Underground. So thank you very much, Wolfric Stonefang. Next, we have the Ward of Helios. That is one of our most recent wards. It's actually when we took over Leonis's Empire, we split it up into two wards, the Wards of Helios and the Ward of Arctica. So, but the Ward of Helios is what we're going to be speaking about now, and that is by Cody Shading, the Warden of Helios. And uh, what he says is, This freezing area of the world was originally home to Leonis's Empire of Mechanical Contraptions and Automata. Now, after Lord Frigoberto gained an advantage in the war against him, he had surrendered his remaining lands and himself to the Kingdom of Aurelia. When I come to this eternal winter, Cody, Cody writes, I am surprised at how well the locals have survived. They seem to be more used to the cold as well as having a way to survive. They sow and grow fruit-bearing plants that can survive at this temperature, and they hunted and harvested the various Arctic wildlife. Speaking of the locals, they wear primarily fur clothing, despite their technical culture. Their houses are made of stone and brick, and the roofs are made of tiles. They have factories that are supposed to produce tools and new automata to serve various tasks. Speaking of the automata, they said there are plenty to go around, the citizens of Helios, but now Leonis has resigned, and the locals lost the will to operate the factories that produce such machines, and their numbers decline every year. Based on what I see, he writes, these automata are designed for specific roles, such as agriculture or mining. As for religion, the people of Helios believe in Arcticana, actually Arctica, and Helios. Arctica is the goddess of the winter, snow and ice. The other, Helios, is a god of progress. I don't quite understand these deities, he writes, but I will learn over time. Now, Cody is actually traveling to Helios to rule it. He is not a native. He is an Aurelian human. I walk into the throne room of the once proud Dreadnought to walk up to the throne. Upon sitting on it, my leadership as warden begins. And hopefully it will continue and we'll hear more about the Ward of Helios and its people. Interesting to note that despite being so sophisticated, they have to wear furs and they have to kind of look a bit more barbarish. Barbarish? I just made up a word. Barbarish. Barbarous? Barbarous. That's the word I'm looking for because of the cold. They're, so they're very sophisticated. They're very cosmopolitan. They have advanced machinery unlike anything else in the world, and yet they have to wear furs all the time because it's so blasted cold. That's pretty funny. So finally, we have our final ward to talk about, and that is the ward of the Valley of Knowledge because there is this giant valley here, and it is loaded with lost libraries, which is how it got its name. This ward is the home of two cities that each worship a specific god, or at least are the home center point for the specific gods, Wodanaz in Heraltasane and Aquarise in Aquarisia. In fact, I for totally forgot Aquarise when I talked about all the different gods of Aurelia, and I'm super sorry about that, especially to Aquarise's chief priestess, Ermanon. So Aquarise is the god of, I guess, togetherness, kind of openness. Aquarise is a peaceful god. And I say god, by the way, but it's not necessarily a male. It's a non-gendered entity. But uh, that is why in Aquarisia, there are no military buildings. It's all about magic research and 
piety, and so they are not a center of troop production. But Ermanon, the chief priest of Aquarice, is also the elected warden of this ward. So let's see what Ermanon has to say about it. The Valley of Knowledge, a place whose people are in some ways opposite, but in other ways not so different. While Haraltasain, the holy city of Wodenaz, was known for thriving in a blighted land. Yeah, look at this. Look at, they're right here in this, all these majestic farms in this land that before that was, was blighted and dank. They are also known for remembering the old world more than any other. Aquarizia, the holy village of Aquarize, because at the time of this writing, Aquarizia was only a village, but now it has grown into be a, a large town. By contrast, was more about peace and harmony with the world. Yet despite this, the two cities in the Valley of Knowledge have things in common. First off is a love of learning. As expected of the Valley of Knowledge, learning is valued. Both city and village have begun to think about implementing a public education system. Both cities have been inspired by ideas from the Old World. While this is easily noticeable in Haraltasain, where the Allfather of the Old World is honored, Aquarizia recently started to take inspiration themselves. In order to prepare for a possible troll attack, a group of Aquarice followers volunteered to learn how to fight to protect the civilians. These volunteers are known as the Shinobi of Aquarice because of the old world ideas that inspired them. Adaptability is a characteristic that Aquarizia has begun to pick up, in part from adapting tools to weapons that the Shinobi can wield, but also in part because of a ban on spider silk cloth that was put on them by the master of coin, Tavis Kavati. With no indications of the ban being lifted, the villagers learned how to use the herbs that grew in the temperate regions in order to stay on their feet economically. Finally, both settlements in the Valley of Knowledge have a determined spirit that is difficult to put out. Heralta Sains came from the old world and learning to live in a blighted region. Aquarizias came from having to prepare in the event of a potential attack, as well as having to live with the aftermath of a controversy that effectively exposed the flaws of Aquarice. I don't know what that controversy is. I... Tell me more! <laughs> Among the residents of Aquaricia include veterans of the year-long siege on Druze by the spiders, though some of those veterans remained in Druze to help keep it safe. And Druze is up here. It is a city of giants that we have annexed into our empire. Not technically part of the ward of the Valley of Knowledge, but as uh, Ermanon says, many of the humans in Druze, I guess, and perhaps some giants too, I don't know decided to move to Aquarizia after the city was taken over by spiders. Ensuring that the two cities in the Valley of Knowledge work together and trust each other might be tricky, but it's not impossible, for the two places as people have much common ground. All right, awesome. Thank you, Ermanon. And again, I'd love to hear about that controversy that exposed, exposed, <laughs> not exposed, exposed the flaws of Aquarice. So that is where we're at, folks. Our next steps after this are to move against Carl, which we are going to do heavily, and see what happens. If someone else decides to declare war on us, which is quite likely, we may have to defend ourselves and fight on two different fronts. We currently have Preston Garvey and Leonis leading an expeditionary force out here to see if there's land that we can claim, especially again to get the heart of the Blight. We have Anya preparing her legion for an assault directly against Carl. And then we have Frigoberto, who is just touring the land here, searching for sites of magical power with his friend Ikera, the Seeker, who is a worshiper of Stoica, and her role in the Stoican Church is to seek out sites of forgotten power. So that's what she's helping Frigoberto do. We also have other heroes scattered throughout the Empire doing various things. But... Uh, in addition to expanding our wars against Carl, it's quite likely that we're going to want to develop a city somewhere on this peninsula as well, which is why we have Satura the Dark, Bosper the Fat Cat, and Gaspard the Chevalier. I think Bosper might actually be down here in... Yeah, Bosper's down here in Stokana, but eventually they're all going to go north here and clear out this land and help us out here as well. So that's going to be something to look forward to 
in the near future. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, I am Marcus Aurelius. I would like to thank very much all of the wardens who submitted written descriptions of their wards and their people. I hope that you, the viewer, now have a good understanding of these different regions of the Empire of Aurelia, what they're known for, what they're about, and the wardens will continue to flesh out their wards over time and will provide kind of a ward's eye view of events that are going on in the world at large. So I'm really looking forward to that. And of course, we still have one more ward. That is the ward of Arctica to discuss its history as well as soon as Kyonanon gets that to me. And since we haven't heard from Admiral Emerson in a while, I suppose I'll have to talk about the Ward of the Sea, although it's more like a militarized area than a true ward, as it does not currently contain any cities whatsoever of Aurelian citizens, but only our two annexed tributaries, Lashanti, the city of Merfolk, and Druze, the city of Giants, and of course our Aurelian Navy, which is currently being gathered. So I'd like to thank you all very much for watching. Have a good one.